So now that we understand better the risks that are associated to making bold hypotheses about the nature of the objects we are trying to observe with our interferometry, we are ready to go about testing these bold hypotheses. And our approach is going to be that of modeling our visibility measurements. That is going to consist in building simple parametric representations of objects that we think are representative and we're going to go about testing the relevance of these models uh, to our measurements. To do so, we're going to rely on our good friend, the ventilator Zanicki theorem again. Now, you remember the ventilator Zanicki was this very nice uh, Fourier transform relationship that relates our visibility measurements that are measured in some space that we call the UV coordinate on the UV plane uh, to the intensity distribution of our object as it is expressed in uh, coordinates on the sky. And in this case, we're going to use alpha and beta as our uh, vertical and horizontal uh, coordinates on sky. You could be very satisfied with this and simply say, well, that whatever uh, target you want to observe, whatever model you want to try, you could simply uh, plug it in that into a computer and go about uh, computing its Fourier transform and come up with an amplitude and a phase map that are associated to this model. You could use a numerical package to simply uh, do all of the uh, heavy lifting for you and uh, come up with um, some criteria that quantifies whether that model is representative at all of your data. We're going to try to do something a little different here what I would like is you is that you build up some more um, intuitive understanding of the uh, relationship, uh, the, 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 the properties of the Fourier transform operation. And what that is going to help you with is that um, eventually you might be able to simply look at a series of raw uh, interferometric measurements and being able to quickly tell in, uh, in very little time um, something important about the object that, um, that you've just observed. In order to achieve this, we need to go back to um, it, describing and uh, really re-familiar ourselves with some fundamental properties about the Fourier transform operation itself. Now, the first of these properties is going to be that of linearity. The Fourier transform is a linear operation. What that means is that the uh, Fourier transform of the sum of something, you are going to be able to express it as the sum of two separate Fourier transforms. Um, let's see how this is going to be applied to what, what it is we're doing. Imagine that the target you, uh, you want to observe, you're observing, or imagine that the model you think is actually relevant in this case is a model made up of two uh, little alien faces here placed at two separate places in uh, your um, on-sky coordinates alpha beta here. Using this linearity property you're going to be able to say that although you may not be able to compute the Fourier transform of the uh, sum of two faces of aliens um, if you happen to know the Fourier transform of one alien face, then you could just say that the visibility associated to this um, object, so the compound visibility of um, those two alien faces, is going to be the sum of the individual visibility measurements for these two objects. So this is a, a, a very nice property that's going to help us, allow us to uh, decompose complex objects made of many, many parts as the, and compute their visibilities as the sum of the visibilities of these individual objects. A second property that is important too is that of the translation. Uh, if you've paid attention, you've seen that uh, in the previous case, the, the two alien faces were located away from the uh, center uh, that defines our local coordinate system, that is defined by our local coordinate system. Uh, 
And here I'm simplifying the picture a little bit, only involving one of these alien faces, but deliberately placing it at some location that is away from our local uh, center of coordinates that is defined by uh, the pointing of our interferometer. Uh, the way you would uh, describe this off-center position would be uh, using a convolution operation, something we've introduced before. What you would say is that this off-axis intensity distribution can be expressed as the convolution product of my own axis intensity distribution function, the one that's at the center, and a uh, distribution called the Dirac distribution, uh, delta function also called, that is centered on the point of coordinates alpha naught and beta naught. This convolution relation is very interesting and uh, the fact that we are working in a Fourier space uh, makes our life uh, easier because uh, this, this very nice uh, convolution theorem that states that whatever convolution operation in some space, if Fourier transformed, is going to be replaced by a simple multiplication operation. What that means is that the visibility we are going to register, to record on an off-center uh, off object is going to be equal to the visibility of an on-center object, which is good, and that visibility is only going to be modified by this uh, exponential um, modulation here. Something that uh, in introduces no changes to the amplitude itself, uh, but uh, adds some phase modulation. And here, instead of representing the phase, I'm representing the real part and the imaginary part of that exponential, the complex exponential modulation. What we see is um, some modulation in some direction that happens to be uh, perpendicular to uh, the uh, separation between uh, my ob the object, the location of my object, and the center of my field. And the further away this object is going to be from my center, let me move it here, the faster the modulation is going to be. Uh, familiarity with this property is going to be uh, very important when it, the time comes to look at multiple objects. Take the simplest one, a binary uh, star. Um, the, f the further away the two components of that binary system are going to be uh, from each other, the faster the modulation registered in the UV plane is going to be. And so um, we're going to, we could, for instance, use multiple measurements along a given direction of this modulation in order to tell for sure how far uh, the two components of my binary system are. Now that we have these two uh, important operations, uh, properties of the Fourier transform, we can go about um, maybe defining the, um, some interesting objects we, which we would be able to reuse over and over again to describe um, a wide range of astrophysical sources. We're going to look for uh, archetypes. Now, as fun as they are, alien heads are not a very good archetype. They are not uh, appropriate to describe any uh, actual astrophysical sources. And so we're going to uh, use, of course, different archetypes. Now, if you remember very early on in the course, we uh, mentioned the fact that we would be working on stars. And uh, one of the first stars we showed, featured a picture of was, of course, our sun. And one of the things we said about our sun very early on was that we could build up some pretty representative rep um, model of our sun by simply describing it in terms of um, a uniform disk that is only characterized by a single parameter that would be the angular diameter of that sun. And this uh, uniform disk is going to be one of the fundamental bricks. We could go about making this um, archetype a little bit more sophisticated by introducing additional degrees of freedom. For instance, um, use it to describe an object like another object we've seen, uh, that of uh, Alter, which is uh, 
uh, elongated because it's a very fast rotator. And in this case, uh, one of the models we could use would not be uh, a, a disc anymore, but something that would be uh, elliptical. Now, an ellipse, as opposed to a, um, a disc, uh, requires the introduction of more degrees of freedom. Instead of having a single diameter, you would actually uh, have to introduce two diameters at, for two different azimuths. And in addition to this, you, um, you would have to take into account the possible rotation of that object on the sky, which would make an additional degree of freedom. Now, you also see that the actual pictures um, of these objects um, feature some non-uniformities. You see that uh, we have this, uh, we also introduced this very uh, simple limb darkening model uh, that we describe the fact that the sun is brighter toward the center than it is at the edges, or things like the uh, uh, von Zeipel effect that describe the fact that um, uh, a fast rotator is going to be uh, brighter near its pole than near its equator. Um, we're not going to talk too much about this, but uh, we just keep in mind the fact that we could very well add new parameters to uh, our models to take uh, these properties into account. Another different archetype or typical object building brick for uh, interferometric observation is actually going to be that of a ring or a torus. I want to show you this very nice picture of an object known as HR 4796 a which is an object that was fairly recently uh, imaged with an instrument at ESO called Sphere. Uh, that in, so this is a, a young star surrounded by um, a disk. And um, you can see that the disk has a very strong um, signature in, in this image. And uh, it would be a very natural thing to go about trying to model the disk with a simple ring. Now the ring is going to be characterized by, again, a couple of numbers. The first one is going to be uh, the size of that ring. We expect the actual ring itself to be circular, and the only reason we perceive it as elliptical is simply because we are uh, not looking at it. Uh, it's simply a projection effect. And so if we were to uh, draw a 3D picture of that disk laying in a plane, and um, where the third direction is pointed toward uh, the observer. If we uh, add one more degree of, freedom, degree of freedom, which would be the inclination of that disk, we see that from the point of view of the observer, the, um, something that could have been flat or something that could have been perfectly circular is going to now turn uh, into something that looks elliptical. And of course, uh, that object again because it's no longer central uh, circular symmetric, uh, is also going to be characterized by some orientation on the sky. And so that makes uh, three degrees of freedom to describe this thing. We could push things a little further here. I want to show you one more very cool object that was fairly recently imaged again. This is actually an interferometric image that comes from submillimetric measurements uh, made by some uh, array called ALMA. And this is a very cool image of a very young system called HL Tau, which is a, um, a T Tauri star, a um, very young object, about a million year old. Um, and this incredible image that required antennas to be, to be as far as each other as 15 kilometers in order to reach the necessary resolution, uh, produced this um, very nice image of an extended um, disk in, uh, that is uh, in, inside which you can clearly see gaps. And uh, the assumption here is that the, the formation of these gaps is actually induced by the presence of planets around this object. The interesting thing was that nobody was really expecting planets to actually form that early on in the history of, a, of an object. And so this is a very cool object. Now clearly, this is a more complex uh, image and you wouldn't really be able to model it uh, by a simple uh, toric disk or an annulus like a, or a ring like I featured before and the star is very hard to distinguish from the disk itself. Um, for that kind of object, 
a non-silly um, model could be that of a, um, a Gaussian um, intensive in distribution. Um, some kind of profile that uh, has a, a smooth transition from something that goes bright at the center, decreases very quickly, and then tapers down uh, toward the edges. Now, again, because of projection effects, we need to take into account the fact that uh, we're going to have to uh, um, change of the orientation of this object, and that we're going to have to either measure uh, two angular sizes for two different uh, uh, directions, or to use one actual angular size and then take into account the inclination. So, you know, the same degrees of freedom essentially combined slightly differently. And if we want to um, take into account the presence of these gaps, what we could simply is use our previous uh, ring model and simply add a bunch of rings uh, that um, uh, occult some of the light in different places to uh, represent different gaps. This is um, a model that becomes more complex and typically, of course, in order to um, be fully capable of constraining the different parameters of this model, is, this is going to require a lot more uh, observations. I mean, you may remember some of your high school algebra that tells you that in a linear system of equations, you can you cannot solve that system if you don't have uh, um, more uh, constraints that you have of unknowns. And, um, in this case, we need a lot more observations than uh, we have of parameters for our object. I think with the objects we've just introduced, that would be the ring the uniform disk and this uh, Gaussian uh, profile, we actually have some very good building blocks um, that uh, we are going to be able to, um, to use later on. And the reason why these are very interesting is because they, have, they all three have some very nice and very easy Fourier transform properties. You can actually come up, and I'm going to spare you this because it's actually you know, a lot of equation uh, manipulation here. They, they actually have analytical solutions for uh, each of these. Um, in the case of the uh, ring, for, for instance, the visibility curve as a function of uh, separation in the UV space is uh, following um, a, a function known as the um, first order Bessel uh, function of uh, order zero. Um, we see that this is a function that uh, featured some um, modulation of the amplitude that uh, eventually goes down, but that rings uh, quite a bit as you go away from uh, uh, toward longer baselines. If you look at the same thing, the same visibility curve for a uniform disk, you see that you have something that looks somewhat similar. We still see that we have some modulation of that visibility and with a function that bounces back as you go uh, toward longer and longer baselines. But uh, the, uh, the different bounces are not as pronounced as in the case of a ring and uh, they actually are um, slightly further away from each other. The, the ringing in the Fourier transform of a ring is actually uh, higher and faster than that for a uniform disk. And maybe if you can begin to think like this, you, can, uh, you may be able to see why it's because um, a uniform disk can be thought of as a, a collection of uh, rings, concentric rings that are all add up to it with each other. And so there are, uh, all of these visibilities are going to add up because we see so that the Fourier transform is a linear operation and they're going to um, somewhat smooth out a lot of the modulation of one single ring and uh, lead you to this uh, uh, somewhat smoother profile. And the final example is that of the uh, Gaussian disk. Now, uh, one very cool property is about Gaussian distribution, and the reason why we're using it so much uh, in this context is because the Fourier transform of a Gaussian function, or a Gaussian distribution, happens to be a Gaussian itself. And so 
Here you have like the extreme case where uh, you actually see almost no modulation at all. Uh, you actually don't see any modulation at all, except uh, in the first uh, lobe of the visibility. And eventually, uh, past some distance, the visibility does not, do not evolve anymore. With those three bricks, uh, because they have some uh, nice functions, uh, associated visibilities, that you can memorize and that you can uh, build up an intuitive uh, map of, then you might be, given some time and experience, able to simply look at a bunch of uh, visibility measurements that are plotted along um, in, a, in, a, in a plot just like the ones you have here on the screen, and being able in your head to actually see right away that a given object exhibits a disk or a, a uniform uh, disk or a ring or some Gaussian profile. 